Among the many things that make fighting games great, one thing I've always found to be the most important is having a roster of memorable characters. There's a lot that goes into picking your character of choice. Appeal, aesthetic, characterization, and lots more. But as in all video games, it is imperative to have characters that one can relate to. And because fighting game characters tend to be so wild and eclectic, it also happens to be a fantastic platform for variety and representation. Which is why today we're talking about LGBT and non-binary characters in fighting games. What's interesting is that fighting game characters have a tendency to be kind of surface level in their representation. Much of who they are as characters has to be literally worn on their sleeves, which often leaves little room for growth. And to be fair, there have been LGBT and non-binary characters in fighting games who are... not great. But a good majority of them actually manage to bring out not just depth, but also positivity and self-love that's missing from a lot of LGBT and non-binary fiction. So in honor of Pride Month, I'd like to highlight a handful of LGBT and non-binary characters in fighting games, share their stories, their triumphs, and celebrate what makes them unique and what they bring to their respective games. As the godfather of all fighting games, Street Fighter has a simple premise. Fighters representing all parts of the world come together in a contest of martial skill. Street Fighter 2 was the first game to break the mold set by Street Fighter 1 with the introduction of Chun-Li, the first female character in a player versus player fighting game. Since then, Street Fighter has made it a point to represent as many fighting cultures as it can, although not all of them have been great. As such, it's only natural that Street Fighter also happens to feature a few LGBT and non-binary fighters on the World Warrior stage. Let's start off with the classic champion of transgender fighters, Poison, originally from Final Fight. Formerly a member of the Mad Gear gang, Poison opens her own wrestling show, acting as manager while going around scouting talent to line up her stable. Poison was named and modeled after the 80s glam metal band of the same name, keeping the theme of Mad Gear members being named after rock bands. In Final Fight, Capcom wanted a more lithe and agile fighter amongst the larger powerhouses of the Mad Gear gang to provide gameplay variety, and so Poison and her twin sister Roxy were conceived to fill that role. You might be familiar with a certain controversy and urban legend about Poison's origins as a transgender woman that goes a little something like this. Poison and Roxy were originally women in the Japanese version of Final Fight, and Capcom of America thought it was improper to beat women in video games, so they changed Poison and Roxy into trans women in their localization. This particular myth has caught on like wildfire across the internet, but it is ultimately untrue. There is precedence for where it came from, as this was actually the case with the 1991 SNES port of Final Fight, where Poison and Roxy were replaced by the characters Billy and Sid. But Poison was always trans even in the planning stages of the character, and while I don't have the time to deep dive on this, there is a fantastic documentary by Megaton Stammer that goes into the full history of Poison's development. But I think most of us have already settled on the idea that Poison is, and always was, a trans woman. What I think I really admire about Poison, and why she's one of my favorite Street Fighter characters, is that you really sense that she owns herself. Poison loves who she is, she's comfortable in her own skin, and she wants everyone to know it. We don't know anything about Poison's life in Metro City before or during the Mad Gear years, but ultimately it doesn't matter. The poison of the here and now is living her best life, and anyone who doesn't like it will be on the receiving end of her whip. Seth is the final boss of Street Fighter IV, the CEO of SIN, a subsidiary of Shadowloo that develops weapons technology. Seth is an android, one of many produced by SIN to use as replacement bodies for M. Bison and who has also developed a sense of self-awareness and is plotting to overthrow Bison by copying the abilities of the most powerful fighters in the world. On his first appearance in Street Fighter 4, I really didn't think much of Seth. A literal featureless stand-in with copied moves and vaguely evil ambitions to serve as a final boss, and nothing more. I was content to file Seth away in my mind cabinet as yet another forgettable flop and never have to think about him ever again. 
And then this happens in Street Fighter V. And it is so interesting that, goddammit, now I have to have thoughts about Seth. Somewhere during the end of Street Fighter IV, Juri defeats Seth and destroys his original body. But then somewhere before the events of Street Fighter V, Juri finds Seth's brain and puts it into a mechanical body called Doll Unit Zero and reactivates Seth for... some... reason. Okay, never mind the actual plot, because it's stupid. I have a much more interesting interpretation of these events. As an android, Seth was presumably built as a machine with no human origin. Their sole purpose is to copy and integrate data with the directive of becoming stronger. Despite having copied data from the original World Warriors, Seth was defeated by Jury alone, so logistically, in order to become stronger, Seth just needed to become Jury. In a weird way, Seth in 5 is more self-actualized and defined than the clone that they were in 4, and with their V-Skill, they possess the infinite potential to become anyone and anything. Seth's most consistent imagery is the giant yin-yang ball in their belly. This is one of the most prominent symbols in Taoism called Taijitu, which teaches a philosophy of dualism and the scale of extremes. The Taijitu demonstrates plainly that the presence of two opposing energies is what creates the whole, and with Seth's apparent transition, what was once a hollow copy of humanity has emerged as a wholly realized individual, capable of self-expression and growth. Which would make for an amazing narrative if the actual story mode didn't completely contradict me. According to the actual canon, Seth's integration into Doll Unit Zero is incomplete, causing mental instability and hallucinations. As a result, Seth is singularly focused on their original goal of defeating and usurping M. Bison, and can't even tell M. Bison apart from those who just happen to have psychopower. Despite the Taiji 2 imagery, Seth is even more fractured and incomplete than they were in 4, driven to chase the shadows of their former life. I wish this piece of the canon wasn't here, because what's actually expressed visually and through gameplay is so much more interesting than what's written. Such wasted potential. As someone who is years deep into Grand Blue Fantasy, I have been very pleased with the roster picks for Grand Blue Fantasy Versus. And with the proper conclusion of Season 2's DLC, I can say with mathematical accuracy that Grand Blue Fantasy Versus is the gayest fighting game, featuring not just two trans characters, but also three lesbians, two gorgeous night boys who feel very strongly about each other, and Belial. While I unfortunately don't have the time to talk about all of them, I'd like to at least talk about the most important two. In the Sky Realm of Grand Blue Fantasy, Lariva is the star duelist of the Jewel Resort Casino, a flying luxury cruiser that is home to their famous dueling ring. As a duelist, Lariva is more than just a fighter, she is also an entertainer, one who uses her platform to spread a message of love and kindness to all who bear witness. The question of Lariva's gender begins with her race. In the world of Grand Blue, there are four dominant civilized races. The ambitious humans, the mystical Erinne, the pioneering Harvin, and the industrious Draff. Among the four races, Draff are the only race that features distinct sexual dimorphism. Draff women are short, plump, and well-endowed, while Draff men are built like brick shithouses and also well-endowed. So while Ladiva's physical appearance showcases primarily male traits, her gender identity is one of choice. Ladiva believes wholeheartedly that she has the soul of a lady, which isn't even that far of a leap if you've seen what young Ladiva looks like. I've seen some people debate that since Ladiva is basically a wrestler, that her whole love shtick and ladylike mannerisms are just a gimmick, that it's basically all kayfabe to create a character for the ring. There is technically historical and cultural precedence for this theory stemming from Kabuki Theater. Female roles in Kabuki Theater were traditionally portrayed by male actors called Onagata, who were sometimes said to be more pure and traditional than real women. To become an Onagata was not simply to imitate a woman while on stage, but to become a woman in mind, body, and soul, eventually leading to the proliferation of the archetype of foppish effeminate men in pop culture. While it's easy to see the angle of a big, burly draft man wrestling people by hugging them to death and proclaiming to be the Herald of Love as a wrestling gimmick, there are enough side stories to prove that this simply isn't the case. Lariva continues to act like this whether or not she is in the ring, or even if there's anyone present. She's
she simply has a genuine, all-encompassing, platonic love for all living things, and she is not afraid to express it. No one in the story ever bothers to bring Ladiva's gender into question, and proceeds to treat her like the kind, gentle lady that she is. She even gets invited to shopping trips, sleepovers, and girls' nights out. The only instance in which Ladiva's gender identity is even addressed is in a Crossfate episode featuring Ladiva and the alchemist Cagliostro, who offers to use alchemy to give her a real woman's body. Ladiva refused, stating that this is the body her parents gave her, and she wants to honor them with it. Cagliostro respectfully accepts this answer, and the topic is never raised again. Oh, speaking of which... Cagliostro is an adorable alchemist, ever in search of new knowledge and experiments. But she's not just any alchemist, she is the godfather of all alchemy who created the craft several thousand years ago. Cagliostro was born as a boy, brilliant of mind but frail of body. Seeking to escape this painful and crippling existence, Cagliostro applied themselves to the study of magic and sciences, blending the two to create the art of alchemy which they used to transfer their soul into a new, healthier, female body. And by way of frequent and seemingly limitless soul transfers, Cagliostro has endured the passing of a millennia, choosing the form of a gold-haired little girl every single time. Why she chooses this form remains a mystery. It can be speculated that this form was meant to take after Cagliostro's sister, the most important person to her during her mortal years. But with her past long behind her, Cagliostro dedicates an eternity of study and experimentation toward the end goal of becoming the single cutest being in the entire Sky Realm. Cagliostro often presents herself as being bright, cheerful, and coquettish, but her true personality is that of an egotistical mad scientist. Combined with her short temper, her petty disposition, and a massive superiority complex, it does not take much to see Cagliostro flip between both personas at the drop of a hat. Cagliostro is not also above exploiting her youthful guys to coax strangers into letting their guard down around her. You might be wondering if this is all a ruse, that Cagliostro simply uses a female body for catfishing and nothing more, but I don't think this is the case. Cagliostro's obsession with cuteness is the pursuit of an ideal, something that is personal to her, the form she has chosen for thousands of years without question. There is no separation between the little girl and the ancient alchemist because neither are fake. She is the adorable genius alchemist Cagliostro, the pinnacle of cuteness, and the great founder whom even the Astrals fear. So this is the awkward part of the video where I realize that I can't really talk about LGBT and non-binary characters in fighting games without also talking about Mortal Kombat. I have very few kind things to say about Mortal Kombat nowadays, but none of them have to do with its LGBT and non-binary representation. But as someone who is also not as invested in MK's character or lore, I don't feel like an exploration of these characters would be sincere, which is why I'm arbitrarily handing this off to Fort Snake. Here you go. Kung Jin is Mortal Kombat X's next generation successor to the classic MK character Kung Lao. Jin is the most standoffish of the new heroes, causing the most strife among the team, but making up for that with his knowledge and wit. His attitude is a result of two aspects of his character, his fear of rejection and his family being discarded by the Shaolin after his cousin's death two decades prior. Although not stated outright, Jin's homosexuality is hinted at by a heart-to-heart -heart he has with Raiden in a flashback, and confirmed by a writer on Twitter post-launch. Jin's fears are understandable given how he and his family were already rejected by the Shaolin for something outside of their control, so the idea that this tradition-driven institution might reject him for what many in the world consider to be a serious affront is a perfectly reasonable assumption to make. This fear of being open is, naturally, relatable for many in the LGBT sphere, and him being the first confirmed LGBT character in the franchise gives him significance in the fandom, even without the game itself being open about it. To some, this is not enough, but to others, it allows Jin to be a person instead of a token, defined by his personality and his actions instead of his orientation, the thesis of this idea being supported by Raiden in the aforementioned Heart to Heart. They care only about what is in your heart not whom your heart desires. And Jin's relation to his predecessor serves as a subtle nod to this aspect of his character, as the other three successors on his team are the children of existing characters, connected to them by heterosexual relations, while Jin is Lao's cousin instead of his descendant, effectively using this and his divisive personality to make him stand out from the rest without dividing the team explicitly by their orientations, despite the other three having only displayed heterosexual desires thus far. 
Kung Jin is an exercise in subtlety, establishing the character as a person first, while laying the groundwork for a respectful coming out in a later game, so as to avoid giving the impression of simple tokenism. Alongside Jin, MKX also took two long established characters and revealed them to be in the LGBT camp, but still with a subtle approach. Both have long established seductive qualities to their characters, the occasional implication of relations, most notably between Melina and Baraka. Both characters were then placed into a suggestive relationship, with Melina calling Tanya Dearest Tanya, and having flirtatious dialogue with her in their pre fight intros. Evidently, the two being the first female LGBT representation in the series informed much of Melina's characterization for her return in MK11. Many of her interactions with other characters revolve around Tanya's supposed disappearance and death, and her arcade ending sees her revive Tanya and the two have a child together. As with Jin, this approach can be taken in one of two ways. That the subtle approach in MKX was not enough and that MK11 was an improvement by making it far more explicit, or that MK11 made things a tad too explicit and that MKX's less forceful approach to depicting their affection allowed their personalities to be front and centre instead of their orientations. Or the third stance, that Melina getting lips so that she can be kissed to death by another woman in the game that establishes her as bisexual is one of the most tone-deaf things they could have possibly done with her. Regardless of one's view, however, Melina's relationship in particular is an important development in her narrative, as hers is the story of a puppet finding its own purpose. In the original series, Melina drifted from one master to another, serving under each major antagonist in turn, before briefly sampling power in her MK Armageddon bio, and immediately surrendering that power to her original master, putting her right back where she started. In the modern timeline, she's quick to seize the throne after her father's death, and spends the rest of her canonical story trying to reclaim it from a usurper. All of Melina's followers either betray her or secretly plot against her, with the sole exceptions being Baraka, who dies in her service in a flashback, and Tanya, the one person who, despite her historical duplicity, is never suggested to have any plans against Melina, suggesting that the evil clone designed to replace her original and serve her creators, has finally found someone who loves her for who and what she is, serving as a powerful symbol of finding acceptance in a world of rejection. Kung Jin may well have reached a similar conclusion had he made the cut instead of Jackie Briggs. Okay, okay, we can cut it off right about there. Save it for a waste of potential or something. We got more characters to talk about. Guilty Gear is about heavy metal, and at the core of heavy metal is counterculture, the desire to be different and break the status quo. Heavy metal is about having a voice and making a declaration as loud as thunder. And if there's anything that Guilty Gear characters embody from their heavy metal influence, it's loudness. When it comes to representation, Guilty Gear never settles for tokenism. Its characters are a wild collage of ideas and concepts, pieces of a larger whole that give the character depth and meaning, even things like ethnicity and ableism. It should come as no surprise that Guilty Gear also features a handful of LGBT and non-binary characters, and what they represent is no less nuanced and detailed than the rest of their kin. Venom served as a high-ranking member of the Assassin's Guild. He was once under threat of termination from the Guild until he was spared by Zato-1, whom Venom views as his personal savior. Since then, Venom has dedicated his entire being to serving Zato during his time as Master of the Guild. Venom's undying loyalty to Zato is tested again and again, first when Zato dies and his body is taken over by the forbidden beast Eddie, and again when Zato comes back to life and is targeted by a shadow conspiracy. Venom has demonstrated, moreover, that he is willing to put all on the line for the man he calls his savior. It is no secret that Venom is gay, and that his loyalty to Zato comes from a place of love. You can even see that Venom turns to thoughts of Zato when attempting to resist Elfelt's love bullet, and that Johnny can steal love letters from Venom addressed to Zato. But Venom's story isn't one of outspoken pride, it's about his anguish and pain. Not just his struggles to prove his loyalty to the man he loves, but also in how that love often twists into obsession, and how often he hurts himself for it. Venom's love for Zato comes from a place of diminished self-worth. Because Zato was the first and only person to give Venom acknowledgement, Venom places his entire value as a person on his loyalty and dedication to him, even going as far as to chase Zato's literal shadow and preserve his dignity and death as though it were his own. Although he continues to struggle and do what he believes is right, Venom eventually learns that he must value himself and put stock in his own dreams, finding solidarity with... Robokai, of all people. And as such, he has to let go of his past in order to move forward towards a future for himself where he retires and opens a bakery. What I find important about Venom is that his story isn't simply about his love for another man, 
It's that same love that blinds him from the pain he inflicts on himself, and he must learn to open his eyes and see that he needs to love himself first. Bridget was born to a small village somewhere in England where having same-gender twins was considered an ill omen. His parents were unwilling to sacrifice or exile their other son, so instead they raised him in secret as a girl. Despite this, Bridget was aware that his mere presence was a burden to both his parents and his village. And so he sets out on his own to strike it rich as a bounty hunter and prove that he isn't an ill omen like the superstition says. Now some of you might be wondering, why is Bridget on this list? He is neither L, nor G, nor B, nor T. I'll admit that my knowledge of gender identities often fails me, but my understanding was that there is a wide spectrum of gender identities, and somewhere on that spectrum is cross-dressing. While Bridget still uses a girl's name and wears a girl's clothes, he still identifies as male, and it's also important to recognize and honor this form of expression. There's a lot about Bridget to sympathize with. The idea of being ostracized by one's own community just because of how you were born is something a lot of people might relate to. Bridget's visual motif is also self-explanatory. He wears clothes resembling a nun's attire while wearing a huge handcuff around the waist. It's not difficult to read this as being literally restrained by orthodoxy. But at the same time, you have to wonder. If Bridget has already left his village, he is under no obligation to respect their superstition. So why does he continue to dress like a girl and use a girl's name? The answer is simple. Because he's Bridget, and those are a part of who he is. Bridget does not begrudge the life he has lived, and rather than be shackled by his traditions, he expresses himself proudly. You'll notice that the handcuff around his waist does not restrict him at all, leaving him free to simply be himself. Despite being literally the least important character to Guilty Gear's lore, it's not difficult to see why Bridget is so popular with fans. Testament has not led an easy life. First kidnapped and transformed into a gear against their will, then mind-controlled by justice and forced to commit atrocities against humanity, Testament has spent most of their existence harboring a hatred for humans, having borne witness to their cruelty firsthand. For fear of humanity's rejection, they then dedicated themselves to protecting Dizzy, a gear just like themselves. But Dizzy, sweet cinnamon roll that she is, believed in the kindness of humans, and while her path has not been without dramatic amounts of trouble, Dizzy did eventually find her own happiness, falling in love and starting a family. Testament had no choice but to accept that they were wrong and let go of their hatred in order to pursue their own happiness. While Testament has been regarded as non-binary since the get-go, it can be inferred from earlier depictions of them that they were still male-leaning. Their voice work and their artworks depict primarily male features with little room for ambiguity. In retrospect, I sort of see this as reflective of how they were in the story at the time. Testament still saw themselves as an enemy to humanity, and as such chooses to appear aggressive and threatening to avoid trouble. However, Testament's redesign in Strive has deliberately decided to blur the lines on all fronts, giving them a much more ambiguous physique, facial features, and even mannerisms to reflect their new worldview. Even their voice actors were specifically casted to reflect this new direction. In English, they are voiced by Kali McKee, an actual trans voice actor, while in Japanese, they are voiced by Yu Kobayashi, a veteran voice actress who is known to play just as many male roles as she does female. The fact that Testament is non-gendered has basically no importance to their overall plot, but it does have a subtle yet profound parallel to their story. As a gear, they live in fear of hatred and rejection from a world that despises their existence. They chose isolation, seeking any excuse to validate their loathing in a self-perpetuating spiral of negativity. Only after being shown that there is a way towards happiness does Testament emerge from their loneliness and experience the joys and beauty of the world. And perhaps nothing about the world has changed. It's not like people stopped hating gears. But what has changed is Testament themselves. In the time between Guilty Gear X2 and Strive, Testament has become more worldly, more cultured, letting go of their pain and finding small delights whenever they can. Imagine dropping your unfaltering loathing for humanity because you discovered B-movies about sharks. I remember seeing Testament's reveal trailer in Strive for the first time and having the distinct feeling that I was genuinely happy for a fighting game character. I regard Testament as not just a victory for representation in video games, 
but also a bittersweet happy ending for a character who has long deserved it. Testament's story is of their emergence from a self-made monster to a connoisseur of the world, drifting from place to place and taking pride in their existence. Even if the world would reject them, they are still here, as a part of this world as much as anyone else. Like a weed, naturally, as a matter of course. This list is far from the most complete, as there are plenty of other LGBT and non-binary characters in fighting games with their own stories to tell, but what I hope this video has highlighted is some much-needed positivity and empowerment in LGBT stories. There will always be a struggle, a battle to be fought, but with that there will also be victory and triumph. Fighting games are important to me because they teach me that no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what your lot in life is, anyone can fight and anyone can win. In the ring, we are all equal. That's all for today's Avatorial. I hope everyone's having a good Pride Month. Be sure to give this video a like and leave a comment about your favorite LGBT or non-binary fighting game characters. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more content from Sugar Punch. Our channel is supported by Patreon, so be sure to check it out if you'd like early access to future videos and a chance to vote on future episodes of Style Select. I'm ABI, and happy Pride Month, everyone!